welcome to the Trend Talk. We are your hosts, Maravina Jaimes. And Belle Hernandez. Sabor a Mi is a song made famous by Iri Gourmet y Los Panchos. It has been given a new spin in a fresh music video by multi-award winning director, producer, and writer, Carlos Alberto Hurtado, featuring Edie's son, David Lawrence. And we'll also talk to actor and writer, Enrique Castillo. For all the work, that he has done in theater, film, television, and literature, Enrique remains humble and rock solid in his position as a trailblazer. So don't go away. We'll be back with director Carlos Alberto Hurtado and my favorite guy, actor, author, director, Enrique Castillo. Well, several generations have fallen in love, celebrated anniversaries, and even made babies to Saborami. With a fresh take on this beloved bolero, please welcome director Carlos Alberto Hurtado. Hi, Carlos. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. <laughs> well, it's wonderful to see you. I know I followed your career for a while and uh, we wanted to ask you some questions. Sure. So, Sabor a Mi was made internationally famous by Edie Gourmet and um, Lawrence, Steve Lawrence, correct? That's correct. And Los Panchos. Um, Los Panchos. So the legacy continues with David Lawrence, the son of uh, Steve Lawrence. Is that correct? It's the son of Steve Lawrence and Edith Gourmet, yes. That's wow, the, uh, I didn't really know that. Uh, so tell us about how this music video came about. Well, it came about, um, well, my publicist, what do you call Mariluz Gonzalez, she contacted me and told me about this great artist who's a film composer, which is Dave. He's an accomplished composer. He's an American Pie High School Musical. And she told me that he was doing a song, Sabor a Mi, a, a retake on his mother's old song that he did. And then he put me, we got in contact, we started talking. Um, I started talking to David and just talking to David, he started talking about his mom, about you know what it really meant for him, you know the heart that it was coming from. And he wanted to make it something really special. It means a lot to him because his mom had passed away, I believe in 2013, 2014, around that time. And this was like a gift for, her, for his mom and also to launch his career and to do something new and to bring a, just a whole different audience. So when we talked about the first time, it was really about family, about how we're really connected and how I'm really close to my parents and how he was close to his mom and his dad is still here. And we just really vibed on that whole family connection. And that's how it just started evolving. And then I just ended up meeting uh, also his wife, Faye, who's amazing. We worked through you know pre-production, working on the story and everything. And yeah, it was just a really nice kind of fluid uh, production in terms of you know the harmony and just being in sync and just being able to provide something and create something that meant something to both of us. Well, that bolero, of course, is so incredibly unique. Uh, I mean, it's even complicated to translate it, but the taste of me, once you've been with me, <laughs> I ruined it for everybody else is basically what the song says. Yeah. But um, we're so impressed with uh, all of your incredible uh, nominations for your film work. You've been nominated over 200 times. You've been on many, many lists, uh, up and comers and up and comers and up and comers. Um, but this uh, video that you did of Sabor a Mi, sung by David Lawrence, is also up from, uh, for a couple of awards. Sabor a Mi, si negaras mi presencia en tu vivir, bastaría con abrazarte y conversar, tanta vida yo de ti. Just being nominated 200 times is just, I'm really humbled about it because it's something that I gave up actually a while back when I was in uh, college, I was at Loyola Marymount. I was nominated for a student Academy award and get won a Kodak grant. And then I stopped doing it for about, I want to say 10 years uh, because I wanted to work with my parents. I, they have a family business and I really love working with my parents. And then I came back and then, you know, everything just started coming into place because I started doing this again six years ago and just being able to get to this point to be able to work with amazing people like David Lawrence and being able to do these kind of productions really fill your heart. It's not really about the awards and the nominations, it's about the quality of work and what the people you get to work with. That's what really makes it a joy coming back. And 
just being able to be here and speak about it, I mean, makes me happy. Wow. And, and at that, even though you took some time out, mm -hmm. you are one of the up and comers that, and were listed in the 20 emerging Latino filmmakers that you've been, you've been lauded with that, that title. Yeah. And you've also taken your films to cons, not just once, but twice. <laughs> I mean, con is like the festival of festivals, wouldn't you say? It is. I, that was a great privilege. And I, again, it came back to projects that really mean something to me. The first time I went out there in 2015 when I went was for a project, <clears throat> excuse me, for a project called Holly Grove. And it's an outreach program that Marilyn Monroe was actually part of a long time ago, that she was an orphan for a little bit. And now it's an outreach program that helps kids who you know, are battling with addiction and who don't have parents and a strong foundation. And then after that, I did another project that was in 2017 that went back over there, which was Dear Dad, Padres Contra Cancer, which is Evan Lagoria's uh, charity. Right. And you know, those projects are, again, going back to things that really that I love to do are projects that come from the heart and are trying to help people. And I think, you know, what I do, the little that I can do with my art to be able to inspire people and being able to show them something that they can inspire to be. I think that's where the fruit of the labor really comes and the joy comes from making things. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you've done wonderful work, and of course, uh, you know, there's a special positive message beside, behind what you do. Uh, but real fast before we end the, the uh, interview, what is, your, um, what is your dream film that you're ready to do? My dream film? That's a good question. Uh, it's a feature that I've been working for a while, script-wise. It's been completed. It's called Space of Between. And it's, again, going back to a story about family and how we deal with death in a certain section of our lives. I think a lot of people deal with death in a very, you know, different way, like how we're all individuals and unique. Some people deal, you know, can grieve maybe a month and they can get over it. Other people go through addiction, other people need counseling. And it's about, you know, this story of, of a family and how everybody deals with the death of, a, of their sister or daughter and just being able to grow and know that, you know, if you keep on living in the past and regressing back to the past, you're never going to have a present. If you can't have a present, you won't be able to have a future. And I think, again, it goes back to those family films and being able to encourage people who are going through issues and going through problems. I wouldn't say issues. I would say challenging moments that are going to make you a stronger person. And well, I'm just curious, out of curiosity, what is the family business? A family business, my dad's business that my mom and my dad started. Uh, we work with architects and interior designers uh, all over the world, and they do draperies and upholstery uh, for architects and interior designers. That's awesome. Oh, wonderful. Well, um, we look forward to, of course, anything that you're doing that's new, but also where can people see this beautiful interpretation of Saorani? Uh, they can see it. Uh, um, I don't know the exact link, but you can type it on YouTube. Just put David Lawrence Sabor a Mi. You'll be able to see it there on his official uh, YouTube channel. Or you can always log on to my uh, website, which is Carlos Hurtado, uh, Films com, And you'll just go through the bi uh, bio and you'll find a link right there. Wonderful. Well, thank, well, you thank, so thank you so much, Carlos. Thank you. No, thank, thank you so much for having me all the time. I, I really do. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. We wish you, wish you continued success with all of your endeavors and look forward to the film. It sounds really good. Um, yes, and don't go away because we'll be right back with Belle's favorite guy, actor, author, Enrique Castillo. Up next on the Trend Talk, we have an actor who has given Latino audiences characters they can be proud of. Beginning with his days working with Luis Valdez in El Teatro Campesino, to TV's The Waltons, Gregory Navas, Mi Familia, and a prison gang leader whose mission of unity and Mexican culture still rings loudly for millions of his fans around the world. Let's take a look at his work. We're talking about my husband. I am trying to find... Reyes. Lo trajeron ayer. Las computadoras no sirven. ¿Qué quiere que yo le haga? Talk to somebody who speaks fucking English. Let me deal with this. Getting angry is not going to help. Me sacó la lengua. ¿Qué tal si te arranco la lengua y te la meto en el culo? What do you want? I thought you wanted it. What? Watch out. I don't want his pork chop. I want his life. 
photograph for your investigation, right? There's plenty in the house, plenty to choose from. That's okay. But if you have keys to our house, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Somebody will be in touch. Okay, guys, disclaimer. I am happy to call this gifted actor my husband for over 34 years. I am his number one fan. I am. Uh, and we, let's, let's start from um, when you started acting, Enrique. You were attending the University of California in Berkeley when you met Luis Valdez of El Teatro Campesino. He invited you to become a member and it turned out to be a training ground for you doing all sorts of things that would let, later serve you in your career. Can you tell us about some of those skills that were honed at El Teatro Campesino? Well, in terms of the acting, it was uh, uh, due diligence, research. Um, there were aspects of it that don't apply now unless you're doing theater. But for camera, it's a totally different medium. But still, the preparation for building a character uh, remains the same. But we, we, we had mask making workshops that we had to do set design and construction, um, improvising uh, roles and uh, play so that he could observe and then write, compile the material that he was watching. And um, that's how he was able to create Zoot Suit. Oh, right. That's where we met, as a matter of fact. Gee. <laughs> <laughs> And we actually met uh, working on a Luis Valdez uh, production, uh, Bandido, which we did together at the Mark Taper. Um, but I want to ask you about your, your feature film work. Uh, your first major feature was with Charles Bronson in Borderline. You played an Army airborne soldier in the Waltons, uh, a college student in Mi Familia, and you worked three seasons on Weeds. Um, but of all the roles that you had on film and TV, you're recognized the world over for your role of Montana in director Taylor Hackford's Let In, Let Out, a classic. Tell us about how you almost missed out on uh, becoming Montana. <laughs> well, um, I believe pretty certain that I was the last person to be seen for that role. When I went in, uh, they were already on location here in LA and I went into the trailer and every other member of La Onda was already cast. Uh, they were just looking for Montana. They had several people, you know, a lot of the top Latino talent um, already that they were looking at. And I met the casting director, um, Roger Musenden, and uh, he didn't seem very interested because I guess I didn't look the role. But my wife had suggested at one point that I used to have a, a black sash that I would tie like a pirate. And uh, when I was working outside or whenever I was going to perspire. And then I had a grown a beard that I trimmed. Uh, and I took a picture like that with uh, a slingshot t shirt. And I had worked out for quite a while. So when he saw that picture, and it just happened to be there because he said, I was showing him my headshot and then I happened to put out other pictures. And he said, whoa, 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 let me see that one. <laughs> who is that? He said, he asked, who is that? And I said, well, that's me. He says, that's you? I said, yeah. And he said, hold on. And he left and he went back into an office and he came back with Taylor Hackford, the director. And Taylor had the picture in his hands and he said, wow, he said, you look so different. I'll tell you what, um, I'm gonna give you something that's gonna tax you and you can turn me down if you want. And what he wanted was, he wanted me to memorize six scenes overnight, yeah. um, a variety of scenes, and then to do a screen test the following day. And that's what got me the role. I, I auditioned, we did the, the screen test with the other actors. And then the scene in the cell with Miklo, 
uh, where I tell him that he should get out of the life and educate himself. And based on that, that picture. That your wife. <laughs> that my asked wife. That you take. <laughs> did you give Bell 50% of your earnings? <laughs> yes, you <he> did. <laughs> the credit card. <laughs> oh, the credit card. Um, you know, and again, you're also, uh, maybe some people don't know, but you're also a screenwriter, you're a director, you're produced. So you do a lot of probably some of the skills that you, you started learning while at the Teatro Campesino. And uh, you did a fantastic, beautiful, very important play that got a lot of attention. It toured two years across the country. It had a congressional reception in Washington, D.C. Tell us about that play because it's so important, the, the content of the play and, uh, be, and what it teaches through a, a production, a theatrical production. So tell us about that. Well, the contribution by Latinos in America's defense goes back to the original the founding of the of the country to the American Revolution. Right, and the play was Veteranos, A Legacy of Valor. I forgot to mention. The play was, the play consisted of material that is documented in the Department of Defense's publication, Hispanics in America's Defense. very educational. I think that all of our young people should be, especially of Latin descent, should be involved to see a portion of this. When Dick Cheney was the head of, of the Department of Defense, and they put together a publication that chronicled all that history. Well, I couldn't do 200 plus years of that history, so I decided to do it on the most prestigious uh, honor that a soldier can receive, and that's the Congressional Medal of Honor. And as far as that representation, Latinos by people in uniform outnumber any other ethnicity. That means that if there are five soldiers in a group, three or four of them are, are Latinos are gonna have a Medal of Honor. So that's how well represented. Um, most Purple Hearts than any other ethnic group, uh, which means you were wounded in battle. And so a lot of that representation, we've never really seen in film or television. And I had already done a production where I played soldiers. And wherever I went, uh, it was always veterans, Latino veterans asking, man, when are we gonna see ourselves up there? There's so many of us. And so, Rather than lobby another production company or Hollywood, I decided, well, I don't trust them anyway to do it right, so I decided to do it myself. So I wrote it on spec for my own production company. I had two other partners, and uh, with their backing also, we decided to mount a production and did the world premiere in 2000. And it was a rousing reception and we toured it and everywhere we went, uh, there wasn't a dry eye in the house, particularly because of the Latinos. Uh, they just felt that finally somebody acknowledged and remembered their sacrifices and the family's sacrifices. Because the one thing we have to remember that most of these soldiers that volunteered, a lot of them, or were drafted in all of these conflicts are basically children going out there. Some of them, their parents had to sign for them to be able to enlist. But you 17 also 17 have... years old, some of them lied about their ages. <laughs> Roy <laughs> Benavides in Vietnam, David Barkley in World War I, Eugene Obregón, 17 when he went to the Korean War. All of these are Medal of Honor recipients that were basically children sacrificing for the freedoms that we enjoy today. But I also forgot to mention, there's another play that you wrote as part of the Latino Theater Lab, which the whole uh, group uh, at uh, LATC uh, was part of the writing process. But eventually it was you and Evelina Fernandez who actually put all of the 
the research and work into a script called August 29th. It was about Ruben Salazar. And tell us about how, who got the credit for the writing? You guys were so uh, <laughs> Well, we, we knew that most critics don't approve of the collaboration process. And so we decided to combine initials from all of our names. And uh, it turned out the, the writer was Violeta Calles. And that was, everybody was trying to figure out, oh, wow, where, where can we interview Violeta Calles? We'd say, well, she's kind of unavailable right now, but we'll be glad to fill in for her in the process. Because it did get a lot of acclaim. It, it, and it won awards also. It was even written about in, in the press in New York mm -hmm. in terms of the importance of the work that was being done out here in theater. And yes, Evelina and I were the, the two writers of record who did the most of the final polishing of the script and whatnot, but the entire lab uh, collaborated and um, workshopped a lot of the scenes. Basically the way we were working was the way we worked in El Teatro Campesino. And then where Luis compiled all of that data Evelina and I were the ones working with the dramaturg and Jose Luis Valenzuela, who directed and was the director of the lab. Uh, we, we were the group that finally put all of the elements together in conjunction with the dramaturg. I played Ruben and Evelina played the female protagonist. It was her story using Ruben's credibility and his integrity as a model for her to follow. Wow. Well, we look forward, hopefully, to the virtual performance of it, but uh, so important, of course. Enrique Castillo, you are an amazing actor, director, screenwriter. You're also an author. Tell us about your award-winning book. Yeah, it won the uh, International Latino Book Award for Best Mystery. Um, and it's titled The Dead of Summer, which has a double meaning. It takes place in the dead of summer and there's a lot of uh, carnage involved. <laughs> but uh, it takes place in the Imperial Valley where I grew up um, on the hottest summer that there's ever been there. And also the worst sandstorm they've ever had there because there's a lot of sand dunes out there because the glamorous sand dunes. And sometimes it's like a haboob that happens. It's, huge sandstorms that happen. Um, the protagonist is a, a Chicano sheriff um, who has a tragic past and there's a clairvoyant character, a woman involved. Um, and the antagonists are a border, uh, an Anglo border patrolman and his cronies. And um, uh, the storyline goes that the Border Patrolman is a, a, a misogynist, kind of like a, he turns into a rapist assassin also. But the reason I put it there is because having grown up there, I had heard a lot of stories and you even hear it today about all of the violence that happens to women along the border. And in particular also over in Juarez and all the violence about more than 300 women that have been murdered, but there's no justice for them. And so I thought, wow, are these women ever going to have any justice uh, given to them? And so I decided how, I asked how, what kind of justice, who would be able to be the Avenger, and how do I weave that into a storyline? And there's a character that appears at the top. Uh, she's fleeing an abusive husband with her two kids, young kids. And her story at a creek along the border actually parallels the legend of La Llorona. <laughs> and so there's a numerical uh, formula that happens because of the, the death of three innocents involved but she survives, the mother survives. And all of these animas that have never gotten that justice along the border, they're all there and they eventually converge and they take possession of this young mother and they turn her into an avenging creature 
Wow. And she goes after these characters one by one. Um, is there an audio book in the works? Not yet, but I've been asked. Also, I've been asked for a translation <laughs> and a yeah. sequel. <laughs> well, let's get it going, the sequel. Welcome back. Our Trend Talk Trendsetter shout out goes to the Actors Fund. Now, although actor is in the title, the Actors Fund is for actors, dancers, singers, directors, choreographers. It's a great source for anyone in entertainment who could use emergency financial assistance, affordable housing, insurance counseling, and so much more. So if you could really use some help or you can make a generous donation, contact theactorsfund.org. And we want to thank you for joining us today on The Trend Talk. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at The Trend Talk Show. And remember, if it's trending, we're talking. We're talking.